Tina koutou, tina koutou, tina koutou katoa. Warm greetings to all delegates of the International Transport Forum. Thank you, Nati Ranana, for providing such a vibrant and unique start to the first day of the summit. The pofri that you have just experienced, ladies and gentlemen, is a powerful ceremony from Māori, the indigenous people of New Zealand that both welcomes and brings people together. It sets the tone for what is sure to be an interesting and thought-provoking three days. And uh, as someone just did, let's give them a round of applause. It is a privilege to be here as the Minister representing the presidency country, New Zealand. I would like to acknowledge France as last year's presidency country and also recognise Denmark as the presidency country for 2016. My warm thanks to Minister Dobrindt and our wonderful German hosts, to the Mayor of Leipzig and to the people of this beautiful and historic city. A city which is celebrating 1,000 years since its first official mention. I wish you well for all the events that are taking place throughout the year 
and especially for the festival week that begins on Sunday. How appropriate that we are here in the city of Leipzig to discuss the theme of transport, trade and tourism, mobility for a connected world. The city has long been an important trading centre. Leipzig was of course the crossroads for what are two of the most important trading routes for the Roman Empire. The Via Regia brought people and trade from the Iberian Peninsula through modern day France to Leipzig and then carried on west to Krakow, Kiev and Moscow. The Via Imperi ran north from Venice through Germany and on to the Baltic coast. But it was here in Leipzig that these two great routes converged, where people met the exchange of goods to exchange news and to exchange ideas. And so it is that once more we come from all corners to meet and continue to exchange ideas. This year's theme, Transport, Trade and Tourism, Mobility for a Connected World, has a very strong resonance for New Zealand. Like many places, New Zealand's place in the world shapes our views. This short video, I hope, demonstrates quite clearly that geographically New Zealand is further from the economic centres of the world than any other developed country. Our relative isolation has meant that we have to be savvy and innovative. We recognise that building strong connections with international markets allows us to access ideas knowledge and resources, and can boost our productivity and stimulate new developments. This is why New Zealand is pursuing and encouraging transport policies that boost connectivity, such as air services liberalisation. We also believe that we have much to offer the world. New Zealand has a reputation for creating high quality, innovative products and is active in many markets. The natural wonder and beauty of New Zealand also makes it a must-see destination for holiday makers and globe trotters. Trade and tourism accounts for 30% of our gross domestic product. At the heart of this exchange of goods and people is a safe, reliable, sustainable and efficient transport system. Mobility connects us and is pivotal for economic growth. Whether you are in the heart of Europe as we are today, or in a growing economy in Asia. We face common challenges as well as opportunities. To achieve a transport system that helps our nations thrive, whether it is climate change, changing demographic patterns, changes in societal expectations, or the impact of new technologies. In particular, the opportunities afforded by intelligent transport systems could fundamentally change the way we move people and goods. The discussions, the debates, and collective thinking that we will undertake over the next three days will help us make the most of these opportunities and explore solutions to shared challenges. The value, ladies and gentlemen, of this forum in promoting meaningful policy to make debates is significant. Each of you in this room today has an important role to play in improving transport and economic outcomes for your own country. Collectively, of course, we are also striving towards the ambitious goal of a connected and a thriving global economy. I trust that the connections made and conversations had over the next three days will continue beyond the summit and form an ongoing constructive dialogue on the key issues for mobility in a globally connected world. I hope the spirit of the welcome from Ngāti Ranana carries throughout the next three days of the conference. Thank you very much.
Wow, what a stirring way to begin a session on trade and tourism. Practically amounts to a virtual visit to New Zealand, reminding us just how powerfully tourism can widen our horizons. Many, many thanks to Nagati Ranana, and many thanks to you, Minister Bridges, for that very powerful beginning. Hello, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, and a very, very warm welcome to the ITF Summit 2015. I'm Melinda Crane, and it will be my great pleasure to accompany you as moderator throughout this opening plenary. Our topic today is transport, trade, and tourism, mobility for a connected world. This year's summit is devoted to trade and tourism because they are, of course, powerful engines of economic growth. But perhaps even more important, they're also drivers of international understanding, cooperation, ultimately peace. Transport, of course, is the backbone of both sectors, permitting ever greater mobility of people and of goods. Trade and tourism are expanding, no question about that. But future patterns can be difficult to predict, given the multitude of factors, the complexity that influence them. That confronts transport planners and policy makers and providers, both governments and industry, with some very critical challenges. How can transport respond effectively and flexibly to changing trade flows and supply chain risks? How can we ensure better coordination and coherence between trade and tourism policies, particularly when it comes to planning for infrastructure? How are ICT advances facilitating integration of transport infrastructure and services to support both trade and tourism? Magnifying those technological and economic challenges is the global push for greater sustainability. As you know, we meet halfway through a momentous year, which, if all goes according to plan, will culminate in groundbreaking new international agreements on a new set of sustainable development goals and on a climate change agreement. These will require innovative new approaches across all fields of human activity, and particularly in energy-intensive sectors. So we can add an additional challenge to our list, how can transport for trade and tourism enhance social inclusion and minimize adverse impacts on the environment? Those are the overarching themes, not only of this opening session, but of this ITF summit as a whole. They're themes that we will revisit in the course of the next couple of days. Before we begin, just one practical item. Not all of the speakers during this session will be speaking English, so if you are in need of trans a translation and did not find a headset on your seat, please raise your hand now, and one of our hostesses will bring a headset around. And here are the channels for translation, just in case you don't have uh, one of the uh, screens uh, uh, within your eyesight. Uh, number six, channel six is English, number five is French, number four Four is Russian, number three is German, number nine is Spanish, number eight is Japanese. So if you need a translation into any of those languages, that's where you will find it. We begin now with a word of welcome from our host, the German Federal Minister of Transport and Digital Infrastructure. He is a member of the German Parliament, the Bundestag, and he formerly served as Deputy Chair of its Committee on Economics and Labor. Would you please give a very warm welcome to German Federal Minister Alexander Dobrindt. Hello. Sehr geehrte Damen und Herren, 
Ladies and gentlemen, guests, uh, Simon Bridges, colleague, General Secretary Yegas, I would l like to welcome you to the uh, uh, International Transport Forum here in Leipzig. It's the uh, think tank for mobility and modernity coming together in Leipzig. And uh, during those days at the ITF, those who bear responsibility have come here, responsibility for infrastructure and mobility in the world, and in this way they are responsible for growth, for work, for jobs, and uh, for well-being. The pyramid of well-being uh, is characterized characterized by the fact that the foundation of growth is infrastructure and mobility. Without infrastructure and mobility, uh, there is no education, there is no work, no jobs, no value added, no innovation, and with that, no chance to create wealth. To create wealth, uh, to safeguard wealth, can only be done through added mobility, and this is our joint and shared responsibility. There has been a veritable explosion in digitization, uh, creating a new dimension in that. The world is facing a next revolution in mobility. You can only compare that to the uh, a time when the car was born. So digitization of mobility means the following. Mobility will turn from a product into a process. And uh, along with that, there are three phenomena. Namely, that mobility will become more flexible and individual, more tailor-made. In the old days, I had to make just one decision when I thought about my way to work, whether I would go by car, by underground, or by a uh, train, by subway, and apply it the same way of mobility every day. Today, if you live in Berlin and when you watch young people, it is every day, again and again, you think about the kind of mobility, uh, the mode of transport from your home to your place of work. And it already starts uh, with the fact that you are woken up at the right time by your smartphone or an app, depending on the traffic situation. And then you decide whether to use some car sharing, whether to go by underground, by subway, or uh, to use some car sharing scheme. So it will be even more individual than in the past. And secondly, everything will be interconnected. Everything that can be connected will be connected. The same is true for mobility. Boston has been a trailblazer in this way, and you can already see it in Boston, how real-time data are being interconnected and uh, how they have an impact on the flow of traffic. In Rio de Janeiro, it's being done uh, with an operation room and from 30 different sources it collects traffic and transport data and uh, passes it on. And in Berlin as well uh, there are uh, smart uh, traffic lights fitted with a smart mobility service. We can measure and have an impact on the speed of drivers and make sure that the green light is used better. And thirdly, ladies and gentlemen, the car will be your third place besides your apartment, your flat, and your office. A place which will have completely new qualities because um, driving is not being done for its own sake. But it will be a productive window in time to use the car as another place of work and your life. I uh, demonstrated it at the beginning, how uh, you can drive an autonomous vehicle, so to speak. The BMW i3 is an autonomous car. I didn't have a driver by my side, and it went without any hitches or glitches, so there was no fault, and uh, it would have been, it was safer compared to if I had been the driver. And you can take it that this kind of technology will 
prevail quite soon and uh, will be available for everybody. It was only a few days ago that I was in an autonomous car, in this case an Audi, and uh, I was on a German motorway at a high speed, and uh, it was completely autonomous driving. You just press a start, you press the start button on your steering wheel, and then off you go. Every veering and steering overtaking is being done autonomously by the car. On the rear seat, there were journalists watching and observing this drive. And at 130 kilometers per hour, I turned around and talked to the journalists, and they were breaking out in a sweat. So for me, as a politician, it was a new experience to see a journalist sweating. And not a bad experience, let me tell you. And we will see it, ladies and gentlemen, that in just a few years' time, what we would call completely digital will be completely normal. And that will be the revolution of mobility, and with that also the new challenge for all of us. We are working on it in Germany, working on digitization, rolling it out for all modes of transport, rail, maritime, rail, sea, roads as well. Interconnectedness of mobility has uh, the effect of added capacity besides added mobility in order to cope with the growth in freight traffic and to make sure that we can do that on existing uh, traffic routes. And it is a process which w has to be designed democratically if we want to benefit from digitization, if we want to leverage and tap the benefits of mobility, then it has to be available to everybody and uh, fast to boot. So we are working on that. We are working on a mobility revolution and to democratize that revolution in mobility. Everybody should have access to uh, mobility. Only then we will be able to tap the growth opportunities and create the basis for future growth and wealth. Ladies and gentlemen, let's make good use of this summit to discuss those challenges of modern mobility. I am deeply convinced that digitization, the digital world, will do away with our mobility chains which we have become used to and will recreate it. Recreating our mobility chains is one of the most thrilling tasks you have as a politician engaged in traffic policies. Thank you very much. God bless you. Vielen herzlichen Dank an Minister Dobrindt. Many, many thanks uh, to you, Minister Dobrindt. Uh, well, certainly that subject, the subject of digitalization and transport, is one of those upon which the ITF researchers have spent a great deal of time. As you know, ladies and gentlemen, the ITF works tirelessly behind the scenes not only to plan this very important opportunity for all of us to exchange and discuss and network with one another, but also, of course, to provide invaluable research on a huge array of subjects, research on trends, on challenges, and on best practices. Under the auspices of our next speaker, the ITF has, for example, developed a work stream for rapid delivery policy analysis for countries, a key innovation given the rapidity of the kind of challenges that we will be talking about here in this session. It is my great pleasure now to hand over the stage to the Secretary General of the International Transport Forum, Mr. José Viegas. Ministers, distinguished guests, I hope you enjoy the next days here in Leipzig and the International Transport Forum's annual summit. This is a gathering of ministers, corporate CIOs, high-level public officials, academics, international organizations, NGOs, representing all modes of transport and their relations to society. I am delighted to have so many of you here 
and so I give you a, well, a warm welcome. Trade and tourism have always been associated with transport. Trade has been, for many centuries, one of the strongest factors for dissemination of knowledge and economic development. The great leaps forward in trade have always been associated with innovation in transport. Identically, tourism was only possible at scale when transport provided adequate solutions. These innovations have sometimes been on the technological front, but sometimes also on organization and business models. Globalization of trade has strongly reduced poverty in the world. World, world poverty is on track to be reduced by 75% from its 1990 levels by this year, according to the Brookings Institution. The Millennium Goal was for a 50% reduction, and we are going to a 75% reduction. And as you see there, global trade accounts for more than 50% of the world's GDP. Tourism is also in a strong link with transport. It's a very appreciated activity by all who can afford it, and there are evolving preferences in tourism according to the level of income. The growth of the middle class in emerging economies will introduce this element of quality of life to many more citizens. Trade, business, and tourism make the large majority of long-distance passenger travel purposes. Transport is the key enabler of transport and tourism. They are strong forces for economic development, peace, and well-being. But there are still multiple weaknesses in the provision of transport for these clients, reducing its efficiency. For instance, we have different infrastructure standards across countries in rail. We have different weights and dimension standards on road freight. We have different container dimensions across modes. We have market access limitations for air transport services and road transport services. And we have physical and information barriers to intermodality for tourists. All of these reduce the efficiency and convenience and ultimately increase costs and emissions and reduce demand. With the expected growth of trade and tourism, difficult challenges lie ahead for transport, not only in the most obvious one, which is infrastructure investment. We must get the regulations and the prices right for efficiency and for sustainability. We have to achieve reliability and resilience in operations, and we have to reduce carbon emissions. All of this at the same time, so it will keep us busy. As trade agreements are put forward, the transport dimension in that facilitated trade must also be addressed, but this is not often the case. Very often, you have facilitation of trade, but transport remains restricted to bilateral agreements. Transport must not be exempt from the efforts towards reduction of carbon emissions. A lot of technological progress is expected, but that will not be enough. We have to obtain significant process as well, and that is possible if we open markets and if we tackle the weaknesses that I signaled earlier. Trade and tourism are recognized by all countries as positive factors for development. Safety, efficiency, convenience, and sustainability of the transport solutions are used for trade and tourism can make the difference between a health development and stagnation. Getting to those solutions involves new policy choices for international transport. As we like to say, transport policy matters. The ITF can have a role in these dynamics. As a formulator of problems, as a coordinator and participant of research, as a disseminator of results, and bridging all these results into policy discussions and recommendations. We do this networking with key partners for, from research, from industry, from civil society, and from government. I want to finish by addressing special thanks to our presidency, New Zealand Minister Bridges, 
and to the host country, Minister Doberent, for all their support in the preparation of the summit. Special words of thanks to our sponsors, Bombardier, Deca, and NXP. Their support is important in making the great quality of this summit possible. We look forward to dynamic debates, lively discussions, and a lot of learning from each other in the days to come. So please join us. The trade of ideas is about to start. Thank you. Many thanks, Secretary General. Well, let's get started then with our trade in ideas. And we begin with a keynote from an economist known for his work on development, inclusion, and trade. He'll draw our attention both to potential gains, but also to challenges when it comes to planning transport in the face of shifting patterns of trade and tourism. He holds the Chung Ju Yung Chair for International Economics and Business at Johns Hopkins University in the United States, and he's also co-chair of the Bernhard L. Schwartz Globalization Initiative at the School of Advanced International Studies in Washington. He's taught at leading universities including Brown, Princeton, Stanford, and INSEAD, and he puts his ideas into practice as a consultant to both the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. A very warm welcome, if you would please, for Professor Pravin Krishna. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. It's a great honor to be addressing you today in this opening plenary session of the 2015 International Transport Forum. We live in exciting times. Globalization is deepening at a very rapid rate. In just the early years of this new millennium, in the last decade and a half, international trade in goods has nearly tripled, and international tourism has nearly doubled in magnitude. Increased connectivity has led to a globally fragmented production process. The iPod, the iconic product of the last decade, which combined hundreds of parts from at least six different countries, serves as a fitting example of the globalized production and trade patterns that we see today. And if we are now more internationally connected in our economic interactions, and if we now have a better appreciation of the peoples of different countries and their cultures through our own travels, and if we have greater economic prosperity and a greater civilization through these interactions, it must be recognized that a large part of this is due to the availability of transportation systems and their increased efficiency over time. This conference will explore the triangular relationship between transport, trade, and tourism. And while this complex and multidimensional topic will be variously discussed and debated in the many sessions that have been organized here, I will confine myself in this brief address uh, to just three broad issues. First, I will note the crucial importance of transportation in generating economic gains. Going beyond just the simple lowering of cost of production in the transportation of goods and extending further into further forms of production efficiency and in generating benefits to the poor. Thus addressing the concern that many have about the effects of globalization on poverty and inequality. Second, I will observe that despite the obvious infrastructure gaps in transportation in large parts of the world, the question of whether to invest more in transport and in what forms can only be answered in its specific context. Designing transport policy with caution and implementing it with rectitude without the shadow of corruption and mismanagement is what will ultimately determine public confidence in transport policy and in public institutions more generally. Third, and perhaps most important, I will note that the nature of change in today's world is a complex one. While, as I've already remarked, trade and tourism have grown steadily, this has not taken place in a uniform manner. Rather, production patterns have seen significant shifts in their geography in the last many years, with many production activities moving away from the West towards Asia, and in particular China, in the last few years, and possibly also relocating again. These ever-changing shifts of comparative advantage, of demographic transitions, technological changes, in my view, uh, raise important challenges for transport policy. 
Let me start with my first point. Transport networks have obviously provided the backbone for the process of globalization. And study after study has shown that improved access to transportation infrastructure can be beneficial at the local, national, and the international level. Research from the World Bank has shown that reducing delays at borders in an exporting country by one day, just one day, through improved trade facilitation can increase exports by 1%. And that improving a 10% improvement in the quality of transport infrastructure can increase trade by 10% as well, suggesting a very significant impact of improved trade and trans improved transportation logistics on trade. Going beyond the straightforward consequences of lower transport costs for trade flows, there seem to be other productivity benefits as well. For instance, in the Golden Quadrilateral Project, which upgraded a central highway network in India, we observe better industrial sorting, better locations of firms. We see an increase in the size of the most productive firms. We see a reduction in the size of the least productive firms, and so on and so forth, all of which signals improvement in the allocative efficiency in the economy. In my own research, I have investigated a different set of questions concerning trade, poverty reduction, and the availability of transport networks. The claim was often made that exposure to globalization is a hard thing for the poor, and that it may lead to greater levels of poverty and inequality. However, by looking across different regions within India, by comparing those regions which are proximate to ports and transportation networks, and comparing those to regions that are not, we actually found the opposite the poverty reduction is actually lower in geographically remote areas, and it is lower due to the lack of exposure of these regions to international markets. This is an important point, I believe, for many of the poorer countries in many parts of Asia, Africa, Latin America, where persistent poverty is a major policy issue. Access to transport networks should clearly be an important part of equitable progress and poverty alleviation strategies. I now turn to the second issue, the conclusion that improved investment in transportation is desirable is not without its own caveats and qualifications. While we generally believe that there is a positive effect of infrastructure and output and productivity, it is not always the case that the benefits of additional infrastructure outweigh the costs. It is, of course, only with productive spending that value is actually created. And indeed, after surpassing certain threshold levels in infrastructure, the marginal productivity of infrastructure may very well decline. And there is some evidence that the productivity of public capital has been declining in advanced economies. As transport networks have become more complete, the average impact of additional segments has been lowered. Furthermore, and perhaps more importantly, the link between infrastructure and growth is much weaker when we measure infrastructure supply using pecuniary measures such as public investment flows. And there's a good reason for this, because of the lack of close correspondence between public capital expenditures and the actual provision of infrastructure services, owing to inefficiencies in public procurement and in outright corruption. Evidence of the waste of resources can cost governments dearly in terms of lost credibility and trust on the part of their citizens. Indeed, a history of poor decision-making and corrupt practices can create major obstacles even for well-intentioned and well-designed projects. In rapidly growing India, the intense struggles of the government, which is now attempting to push through legislation on land acquisition to advance its infrastructure agenda against a backdrop of long-standing public cynicism against public capital expenditures bears testimony to this fact. I turn now to the last issue, a truly contemporary one, the changing economic and social environment and the challenges that this poses for transportation policy. Over the last few decades, the center of global production activity has begun to shift back from the West to Asia, and in recent years especially towards China, which has become an important venue for offshore production. But even amidst this trend, there remain many variations and uncertainties. In recent years, businesses looking for low-cost export platforms in Asia are increasingly considering other countries, like Thailand, Indonesia, Vietnam, and others. 
Indeed, even Mexico is now possibly returning back to favor for many US-based manufacturers. A great many changes are taking place, and these shifts, in turn, raise important questions for us to address. For instance, how is freight demand expected to evolve over time? On the one hand, demand could rise dramatically due to rising wealth and rising trade. On the other hand, changes in energy prices, in trade patterns, in economic geography, as I've just mentioned, could affect each, the origin, the destination, and the mode of traffic, possibly decreasing demand in particular segments and modes. Are our transportation networks capable of flexibly adapting to these changes in demand and usage? Are there alternative infrastructure strategies that allow both efficiency and flexibility of response to changing demand? Further, <clears throat> the demographics of the planet are rapidly changing. A decade or two from now, the populations of many large economic areas, the United States, Japan, Europe, and even China, are likely to be significantly older than they are today. This may, in turn, alter related demands for tourism and for transportation facilities, on the one hand. On the other, enhancements in information and communication technologies and other trends, such as the movement of aging citizens to urban, pedestrian-friendly areas where available, might mitigate the need for changes in transportation supply. It's unclear which way this will go and by how much. Interestingly, just as this is happening, other parts of the world will be getting younger. For instance, it's estimated that over 30% of India's population, that's about 400 million people, are under 15 years of age, and that going forward, about 1 million young Indians will be joining the labor force each month, many in urban areas. These are very big trends. They're relatively easy to forecast, but how well do we understand the impact that they will have on transportation and how prepared are we for those challenges? In addressing these issues, institutional gaps may be as large a problem as infrastructure gaps. Lack of coordination between transport and tourism ministries, for instance, might yield mismatches in mutual expectation of both supply and demand. Similarly, with in international trade, infrastructure improvements need to go hand in hand with other behind the border reforms as bottlenecks might lie as much in poor customs facilitation as in poor transport infrastructure. <clears throat> Finally, there have been extraordinary improvements in computation, in information, communication technologies in the last couple of decades. Has transportation policy sufficiently exploited these advances in searching for new ways in which we meet traveler needs? How can big data methods and digitization be used to realize efficiency gains and improve safety? These are important questions for us. Long-range planning has an outlook of 20 to 30 years, but is often simply a linear projection based on current relationships between economic and demographic patterns. Much like the Times of London forecast in 1894, that given the growth rate of horse carriages at that time, that every street, this was their forecast, that every street in the city of London would be buried under nine feet of horse manure by 1950. Of course, they were wrong, and these linear projections of that sort may be the single greatest weakness of policymaking for transport today. A wide range of technological, demographic, social, economic changes will likely affect supply and demand patterns in the future. These changes and their impacts are not as well understood as we would like, uh, but I'm sure that these are the topics that the collective talent of this audience is very well equipped to address here at this conference and in future research. I wish you the best in your deliberations. Thank you very much. Many, many thanks to you, Pravin Krishna. I just see that I have forgotten the microphone, so we'll go oh. over here and you can use sure. this microphone. Uh, perhaps to just uh, answer, if you would, one brief question while they're sure. getting the stage set up for our panel discussions. You've painted a picture of uh, uh, pretty great complexity in trying to assess where trade and tourism are going, a lot of different influences uh, shaping those patterns. Let's throw another factor into the mix, because you actually didn't talk much about 
about environmental factors. And as I mentioned at the outset, we do now see a very great push to put sustainability into the equation and to try to practice what's called policy coherence in the sense of really making sustainability part of our considerations in every sector, in all policy planning from the outset. But you are a political economist, and so my question to you would be, we're get, hearing a lot of sustainability talk, but are governments and companies really ready to walk that walk? All right, well, from a, from a set of uh, challenging questions to perhaps an even more challenging one, the environment, uh, let me just say broadly that, so, so the great fear is that transport expansion is going to be terrible for the environment. Uh, so you have that on the one hand. On the other, it's reasonably clear that expanded transport is, is necessary often for economic progress, uh, is essential for inclusive growth, uh, and so on and so forth. So there's a very clear trade-off uh, that many governments are, are wrestling with. Uh, I, I see some relatively easy solutions, perhaps, uh, things like mass transport, uh, more energy efficient, better than private cars and private transportation, and so on and so forth. Uh, there's obviously technological change, uh, research, science and engineering research on improved sort of renewable resources uh, that might help as well in the future. Uh, overall, it's a, it's a challenging situation. I think different countries might see their needs differently. Different countries might see their willingness to trade off the one for the other uh, rather differently. Uh, I, think, I think it's just one of those questions that's going to require a lot more uh, policy uh, debate and discussion uh, before it's fully resolved. Happily, it's a question I want to come back to in our second panel, uh, which you will take part in, so uh, you have some more time to think about it. Uh, and thank you very, very much for your keynote to us here today. So a resounding affirmation there that investing in transport for both trade and tourism can boost socially inclusive growth, as Pravin Krishna just told us, but also some notes of caution there for planners and policymakers and for industry. So let's find out how they see it now and what they're doing to take account of some of the risks and complexity that Pravin Krishna did just outline for us. It is my pleasure now to introduce the first first of two very eminent international panels, and I'll ask the panelists to come up one by one and join us on the stage as I introduce them. Beginning with Angel Gurria, he is Secretary General of the OECD, which under his leadership has reinforced its role as a hub for trade in ideas on economic policy. He joined the organization following a very distinguished career in public service in Mexico, including positions as Minister of Foreign Affairs and Minister of Finance and Public Credit. Great to see you again, uh, Mr. Gurria. Great that you can be with us. And it is my pleasure to welcome Warren Truss. He is Australia's Deputy Prime Minister, and he is also Minister for Infrastructure and Regional Development. He previously served as Minister for Trade and also as Minister for Transport and Regional Services. So great that you can join us, Excellency. It's my honor to welcome Anna Johansson, who is Minister for Infrastructure in Sweden. Previously, she was active in municipal politics in Gothenburg, and she also served as its deputy commissioner until her election to the Swedish parliament in 2014. Minister, we're very, very pleased to have you with us on the panel. And finally, a pleasure to welcome Yi Zhao Zun. He is Deputy Director General of the World Trade Organization, both as China's ambassador to the WTO and previously as its Vice Minister of Commerce. He has played a leading role in negotiating free trade agreements. Thank you so much for being with us today. Secretary General Gurria, let me start out uh, by asking uh, you to give us your take on what we've just heard about the complexity of changing trade patterns and the difficulty of predicting uh, how those shifts will look. What approaches do you think are needed for transport to respond effectively, and what strategies best address risk and uncertainty when it comes to supply chains, for example? Um. 
Do we have a, are we wired or here? Okay. <laughs> uh, thank you. Well, uh, I think uh, you, you made a, a very critical question there to Professor Krishna at the end, and that is uh, you have a trade, you have tourism, but you also have um, the environment uh, to take care of. And uh, the idea is trade is one of the most important cylinders of the growth engine. And trade today is growing at approximately the same speed of the world economy. Uh, the world economy is under the average of the last few years, and it's under cruising speed. Um, it's approximating its cruising speed of about 4%, but trade should be growing at 8%, double, and it's growing at about 4%, 25 to 4%. So trade is lagging behind. Trade is not uh, becoming an engine. We need to uh, kickstart trade so that it uh, really becomes uh, a, a critical factor in, again, in the growth engine. Uh, second, uh, tourism, of course, the object of our uh, seminar today, or our two days of seminars, uh, again, a very critical uh, element of growth, in some cases, absolutely fundamental, um, and then the respect for the environment. You, we cannot put any solutions on the table when we do not take into consideration the trade-off that has to do with um, emissions, and of course, transport is a producer of roughly a quarter, 23% of the emissions. And because it is growing so fast, because it is so important, um, so critical for the future of the world's economy, one has to deal with the question of technology, as uh, Professor Krishna already pointed to that, uh, substituting uh, the conducts, uh, changing the conducts, and uh, putting a big fat price on emissions so that uh, we can modify the conduct and accelerate the process of substituting uh, the models that we have today, the technology have, that we have today, the engines have to, that we have today, the batteries uh, that we have today, etc. But uh, uh, going back to our TTTs, you know, our transport and uh, um, trade and tourism, I'd say these are uh, uh, fundamental in the equation of the future growth, of the future welfare, uh, of the future well-being, uh, of jobs, of prosperity. Uh, and uh, so this group of people, this, uh, uh, these experts, these ministers, these uh, leading minds in this area have that responsibility. We in the uh, OECD are looking at the transport as being uh, the center of the recovery with the greater efficiency in transport, greater uh, economies, greater size of the uh, units, uh, and at the same time, clearly, greater economy of uh, energy. So uh, let me just uh, say uh, to, uh, for, this starting, um, for this starting intervention, uh, we see uh, energy consumption from transport uh, representing today 30% of final consumption of associated emissions. Uh, we see um, uh, growth projections for road and rail passenger travel uh, to between 120 and 130% 100 to 2050. So it's between one and a half to two and a half times um, then you're talking a road and, frail and rail freight projected to grow between 230 and 420, so between two and a half and four times. You're seeing dramatic, massive changes in the, uh, the, the numbers and in the volumes, uh, therefore in the value, and, and clearly then the trade-offs between, again, um, the efficiency, the economy, and nature becomes uh, even uh, more important. Thank you very, very much.
Minister Truss, I'm sure that given uh, your country's vast size, what uh, Mr. Krishna had to say in regard to the potential gains from greater connectivity will have rung true, uh, certainly being able to bring more remote regions into connectivity, obviously uh, major economic benefits uh, there. But what he had to say about complexity also must have rung true, given that your country is also looking at some very big demographic changes and also massive changes in trading patterns in your region. How are you factoring those into your planning and investment when it comes to infrastructure for trade and tourism? Well, Australia certainly is a very big country. Uh, during Minister Bridges' opening remarks, you saw the global map with New Zealand in the middle, and we were that big blob out to the western side, uh, where, uh, western side of New Zealand, which was rightly positioned as the centre of the universe. Uh, so it's a big country, and like New Zealand, we're a long way away from uh, the, the rest of the world, and that has always been regarded as a strategic disadvantage. However, we are now situated, without moving our geography, in the fastest growing quarter of the globe. We have now a strategic advantage that the big growth countries like China and others in Asia, India, uh, are very close to Australia and so we now have something of a trading advantage which gives us a unique opportunity uh, to play a much stronger role in, in the global trade network. Logistics makes up uh, around 9% of the Australian economy and that's a reflection of our size and our distance from our markets. Uh, we are not able to truck any of our trade to the rest of the world 99% of it goes by ship and the other 1% uh, on aircraft. Uh, but uh, road transport is still very important to us as a nation. Our three biggest cities, uh, Sydney, Melbourne and Brisbane, are separated by almost 2,000 kilometres. Uh, the fourth city across to Perth, about 4,000 kilometres. And so we do need a very large road network, some of which is not very densely trafficked. But another perhaps not understood a widely understood uh, statistic about Australia is that we are amongst the most urbanised countries in the world. A very large proportion of our population lives in those four cities, cities that I've mentioned and the areas immediately surrounding them. So our, our, our citizens have different requirements when it comes to their road network. For people in remote areas, they're thankful to have a, a, a sealed road uh, to their nearest town. In the capital cities, their four or eight lane or 12 lane roads have got to be made wider. There's more tunnels, there's more uh, uh, sophisticated traffic networks and of course, sophisticated mechanisms for managing the traffic that is becoming such a huge burden in those large uh, metropolitan areas. And, and I come from a, a regional area and I say this with, a, I guess, a degree of nostalgic sadness, uh, that trend is inevitably going to continue. Uh, our cities, our bigger cities are getting bigger and our smaller communities are getting smaller. Even though they still contribute most of our exports, uh, at least two thirds of our exports come from uh, uh, rural and regional communities and they're therefore very important uh, for our national economy. So in, in building infrastructure, uh, we need a road network that's capable of moving products from city to city, country to port, we need a rail network that can carry very big volumes of ore, uh, iron ore, coal, etc., to very large ports. And we need a sophisticated urban public transport system that can move a lot of people around, uh, around our capital cities and, and large provincial areas. So that is indeed a challenge for us as a government. We have uh, the biggest road and rail infrastructure program in our national history. We are building a, a second airport for Sydney. Uh, we are, uh, have a, a range of, of ambitious plans in relation to urban public transport. And of course, we're looking at high speed trains and the other sorts of things that uh, uh, large, uh, uh, densely populated areas now are taking for granted. The final thing I'd like to say though is that this morning we had a session about uh, driverless and pilotless vehicles. I talked about some of the new technology. I've got no doubt that the next generation 
will be driving predominantly electric cars, that they will in many cases be driverless and, and we'll have a lot less. Um, we already have in Australia some of our big mining operations with trucks without drivers and trains without drivers and that that technology is going to extend broadly across, the, um, across our country and indeed much of the rest of the world. So there's an exciting year ahead and in planning our infrastructure we've got to take account of the fact that the technology will be different, the type of energy that we use will be different and, uh, and we therefore I think can continue to have uh, a good standard of living, growing standard of living in spite of the fact that global population will be higher and demands on resources greater. Thank you very, thank you very much. Minister Johansson, uh, your country as a maritime nation, of course, very dependent on trade and simultaneously tourism is now more important uh, in Sweden than it ever has been before. And simultaneously, you are at the forefront uh, of countries pushing for greater sustainability. So let me ask you how you triangulate these various goals when you're look at, looking at planning uh, and investment for infrastructure in both tourism and, and trade. How do you do this in a manner that is both economically productive and also socially and environmentally sustainable? Uh, I can start by saying that if I had a simple answer to that uh, question, I think uh, I wouldn't be sitting here right now. The, because this is, I think, a challenge that we are all facing at this moment. Uh, and uh, some of it, uh, I, I think that it's important to see that transport systems and transports are making it possible to create uh, job opportunities, to create more trade, to create wealth and uh, welfare. So transport systems are crucial to developing modern societies. And at the same time, transport systems are uh, creating problems, uh, both uh, in, uh, it takes a lot of space in our cities, and uh, it uh, makes uh, pollution and uh, contributes to uh, not so positive development in a lot of areas. So what we need to do as politicians, but also as uh, researchers and as uh, uh, stakeholders in, in, in and industries, is to try to find a way where the increasing need for transport, for trade, for exchange uh, during, uh, as tourists or as uh, businessmen or whatever, to do this at the same time as we can tell our children and grandchildren what, that we are aiming to leave a livable, not only livable cities as we speak of today, but also a livable earth. Uh, and that is our challenge to face and to solve. And I think that we need to work on all different kinds of areas to, to reach these goals. Uh, and one crucial thing is, is cooperation. I think that uh, we can reach a lot longer if governments as well as industry and uh, research is working together on finding the new technological uh, solutions but also the new kind of organization and where we as governments need to put demand on the industry and the research to find those new solutions. Uh, we can uh, put up uh, taxes and we can have fees and we can work with different kinds of demands that also can drive development in the technological uh, sector and I, I can I think think there are a lot of different um, examples on this worldwide where we can also learn very much from each other and uh, on this uh, session earlier this morning uh, that we Mr. Trust told us about there was also a very strong uh, need that was expressed for international uh, rules and, and uh, framework in this area and I think that we need more international framework also for environmental and uh, fair working conditions and uh, in all the, the um, in sustainability in all three perspectives we need to take more uh, common lead uh, because if we don't do that we risk to have a situation where countries can compete not with the best solutions or with the most modern technology but with low cost uh, where the price is paid by 
uh, workers and environment, and that is not sustainable at all. So we need to cooperate more and we need to take common responsibility for those very difficult but definitely solvable challenges. Thank you. Thank you very much. And that, of course, was the perfect bridge to come to you, uh, Deputy Director General Yi, uh, an appeal there for greater international cooperation and a strong uh, regulatory and uh, legal framework, also, of course, at the international level. Certainly, what your organization is trying to do in the area of trade liberalization, can you give us a sense of where you see trade liberalization heading and what factors you think will influence the future development of transport for trade? Well, thank you very much. Uh, what we are doing now is pushing uh, the Doha round negotiations, which is to liberalize uh, world trade, uh, including trading services, uh, which also uh, including uh, transport industry. And uh, with regard to trading services, uh, liberalization means uh, increasing competition and uh, opening market for private sector including foreign investment in uh, our sector, in transport industry. That will uh, increase the competition. Meanwhile, it will uh, create more transparent and predictable uh, business environment for uh, this industry. And we believe that uh, the trade liberalization will benefit a lot of countries, in particular developing countries. Because in those countries, the transport industry often is suffering from the uh, poor infrastructure and the lack of cap uh, capital and inefficiency. So by trade liberalization, I think they, those countries may obtain more investment to improve their infra infrastructure and may introduce more competitive service suppliers in transport market. So what, that's what we are doing now. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that. Um, Mr. Guria, I would like to come back uh, to the question of uh, tourism and perhaps profits from some of the OECD's uh, very long-standing expertise in that field. As far as I know, your tourism committee has been in place since nearly 60 years. So give us your view, if you would please, on how we could better ensure real cooperation and coordination between trade and tourism uh, policy makers and also planning for infrastructure investment. We heard uh, Pravin Krishna uh, call for better interministerial co coordination, better policy coherence between trade and tourism. What's your view on how we can accomplish that? Well, uh, there are a number of, of issues here. Uh, one is to take account of the uh, changing uh, structure of trade, tourism, and, and transport itself. Um, tourism is now very uh, much integrated into value chains, into global value chains, the same way that production uh, systems are, uh, both for trade as for uh, tourism. There are a number of things that can be done also on the regulatory side. And that has to, starting with transport, by the way, which is very critical. Uh, we talked about trade facilitation, for example. Um, trade facilitation helps countries uh, participate in the global value chains by, by reducing costs, by avoiding unnecessary delays, uh, by reducing uncertainty. All this also applies to the area of, uh, of uh, tourism. Um, but, uh, and, and of course, the, the idea is to eliminate uh, uh, uncertainties. But uh, let me just say uh, the whole area of services, transport being one critical one, uh, is subject to uh, relatively heavy regulation worldwide. And uh, in the particular case of transport for any purpose, tourism or trade or anything, um, air transport particularly affected by restrictions simply because it's managed not by one single set of rules but by hundreds of bilateral agreements. Um, 
maritime shipping nowadays uh, quite open, I have to say, although some restrictions in cabotage uh, in, in ports. Uh, road freight transport, um, heavily regulated in the past, now less uh, heavily uh, regulated, uh, somewhat liberalized over the years, but um, uh, internationally, trade and road transport services remains heavily restricted in several countries. And of course, the rail freight sector is an interesting case because it illustrates the importance of uh, behind the border measures for, for services trade. Now, international tourists uh, this year are around 1.1 billion, 1.2 billion. They're going to move to 2.5 billion in 30, 35 years time. And clearly, the question of transportation is going to have to gear up for that. Trade is going to quadruple from here to 2050. These are the types of challenges. And I was told today, well, very simply, Mr. Gurria, if trade is going to quadruple, uh, it, if, uh, and, and uh, transport is going to have to accommodate the trade and transport takes care of all the trade, that means transport is going to be emitting as much CO2 uh, as the whole of the world economy emits today. That means you're going to multiply by four, so it's going to be a factor of one time what it is today. Simple arithmetic. They say, no way. No, absolutely no way. So when you're talking tourism, when you're talking trade, uh, when you're talking transport, you have to talk about technology, another T, in order to make it possible for this not to happen. It's simply not possible, it's not sustainable, it's not economically viable, it is not politically acceptable, it's not even possible for people to live under those conditions. Uh, because last year, we already talked about the costs of the quality of the air um, and the, uh, the cost of the deterioration of the quality of the air and uh, the numbers of uh, millions of people that were going to be dying because of bad air and the cost, the economic cost for that to uh, the world economy. Well, here we're talking about what I would call a, an absolute constraint on trade, on tourism, and therefore on welfare in general if we do not uh, take full consideration of this other element, which is um, the environment and uh, uh, climate change. So I would just leave you uh, with these kinds of concerns, some of the issues that can ease the problems of today, ease the restrictions, make it more efficient, make transport more efficient, make transport easier. Uh, but again, don't forget, and this is not about the transport policy, this has to do with the innovation policy, this has to do with the education policy, this has to do with tax policy, uh, this has to do with, with a, a broader uh, number of other policies around the transport policy that would be uh, accommodating these uh, exploding needs over time uh, by this crucial element uh, of their development, which is transport. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, let me ask about exploding needs, uh, perhaps in the field of aviation, air cargo being one place where we can really see that nexus between trade and tourism, because of course, so much uh, air cargo is carried in belly hold transport, meaning that it is directly linked uh, to international passenger flights. Now, air cargo at the moment represents an astonishing 35% of global trade uh, as I learned when I was doing my uh, research for this panel. So Minister Truss, what changes do you think we're likely to see in future in this very, very critical area, and particularly in regard to aviation liberalization? 
Well, I suspect your statistic would be about the value of trade rather than the right. volume exactly. of trade, but uh, and that's volume that's, is tiny, and yeah, the value course, is enormous. Of course, yes, but uh, and because because uh, aviation is a more expensive way to move things from continent to continent, so the reality is it will be the smaller volume, uh, uh, smaller value items. But as I mentioned earlier, Australia is a big continent. Aviation is a very, very important part of our, of our transport task. I referred to Brisbane, Sydney and Melbourne before and it's of interest to note that Sydney, Melbourne, Sydney, Brisbane, Brisbane, Melbourne uh, are all in the top 25 trafficked aviation routes in the world. So we, for a small population, 23 million people, we, are, we, we travel by plane. And that's a practical thing. And we travel to the world uh, by plane. It's really the, the only option. And there's been, there have been dramatic changes in international aviation. Uh, the, the, ra the rise of the Middle Eastern airlines has obviously you know, dominated discussion in that regard. And much of the credit for the role that those airlines now play in bringing people to and from Australia uh, arises from the fact that their holes have been carrying uh, perishable freight uh, between Australia and the rest of the world, particularly meat, but flowers and, and other products as well. So putting um, product in the, in the bottom of the aircraft, even though it doesn't return per kilo anything like the passengers above, uh, has meant that it's possible to move products around very quickly. Now, there are still, however, uh, a lot of barriers surrounding uh, the, the free movement of aircraft around the country and who can own what. Uh, you know, for instance, in years gone by, the airlines coming to Australia were nearly all European. Nowadays, there's only one European carrier that's operating services into Australia and they do one service to the continent a day. Uh, they've completely lost their market share. Uh, from our perspective, we have li very limited rights to land anywhere in Europe. Uh, most of the, most of the uh, big cities of Europe are simply closed for our business. Now, I don't think, therefore, uh, Europe's done well out of that. Uh, the fact that there is no capacity for us to bring our aircraft here uh, hasn't actually meant that those airlines become profitable. Uh, by endeavouring to protect them. In fact, they've lost the market uh, altogether. I often tell the story as a bit of an aside that we, we um, buy a lot of Airbus aircraft, uh, European-made aircraft. They're very keen to sell them to us. But once we've sold them, we're not allowed to bring them back with passengers in them. <laughs> and I think that that's a bit of an example of why uh, free trade works better than protectionism. Uh, now, there are, there are ongoing developments, though, in in global aviation. The rise of the Chinese airlines uh, has been spectacular and it will continue. The, the Chinese airlines are going to be the big challenges to the Middle Eastern airlines in the years ahead and uh, I think that they'll play an increasingly role in, uh, increasing role in quality aviation services around the nation. Um, I think also there are a lot of restrictions in relation to the ownership of, of, aircraft, uh, of, of airlines uh, globally, essentially, if you don't have 50% uh, local ownership of the airline, you're probably not going to be able to exercise uh, traffic rights to other countries uh, on behalf of your nation. Uh, so that is a reason why international airlines uh, have, have generally had 50% of, um, of, of local ownership. But from Australia's perspective, uh, uh, our domestic airlines can be bought 100% by foreigners if they choose to do so. In fact, uh, Qantas has never been 100% foreign owned, but uh, all of our other major air, air carriers have been at some stage or, or are today. And so uh, I think that's helped us deliver the quality of services that we needed, uh, not just internationally, not just between the capital cities, but our two or three biggest regional airports, the ones that do the little routes between the country towns are 100% foreign owned or have been. And so I think that by internationalising aviation uh, of all the transport forms, it has the greatest potential to make a, a substantial contribution towards uh, international travel, tourism, and increasingly also the carriage of freight. Thank you very much.
Minister Johansson, um, let me come back uh, to questions of sustainability and pick up on some, something that uh, we just heard from Secretary General Gurria, namely, we've got to look at groundbreaking innovation and technology if we want to, to decouple economic growth and CO2 emissions. Um, what do you see as the potential for ICT, for new uh, internet and communications technologies, when it comes to transport for both tourism and trade? I know that Sweden has strongly pushed uh, uh, smart technologies, particularly for the cities, but tell us a bit about how you see their potential and how they figure into your planning. Thank you. Uh, I believe, as I said, that uh, technology can be one solution to increase uh, efficiency in the transport system. Uh, and I think that is absolutely necessary if we, as I said, want to have a livable earth to uh, give to our grandchildren. Uh, and in Sweden, we are working, I think that we need to do a lot of things at the same time. And as I said earlier, uh, governments can be very active in putting framework and in uh, putting demand on the market. But we can also, I think, as we uh, are um, uh, doing procur procurement, uh, put demand in innovation so that we as governments also provide new technology and make innovation. Because a, a lot of companies have good ideas. We have a lot of research that uh, is, are in an early stage. And I believe that through procurement and through uh, support from governments, we can also make that happen in a faster way. We can uh, promote uh, testing areas. We can uh, make it possible for, for uh, industry to test new technology, to make it ready for market faster, and to, in a lot of different ways, um, promote innovation. And I think that that means that we can in a faster way reach a transport system that's smarter and more efficient. Uh, and I think also that uh, logistics is a very, very important way to have smart logistics to, because today we have our systems do not always work together in an in a optimal way. Uh, so there are a lot of uh, transports me being made that should not have been uh, necessary. So with smarter logistic systems, with ICT, with self-driving cars, with uh, more efficient, smarter uh, traffic control systems, we can reach a lot longer than we are today. And uh, we cannot sit waiting for the industry to, to um, make this uh, happen themselves. We need to contribute as governments as well in, uh, as I said, providing test areas. We have in 2017 in uh, the city of Gothenburg, we're going to have 100 self-driving cars on the streets. Uh, and I think that's absolutely necessary because if we don't test it in, in reality, we, do not, we will not know what kind of regulations will be necessary. We will not be able to, uh, to um, refine the technology. Uh, so, so there needs to be a cooperation uh, also in this field and to develop new technology in the uh, also in the ICT area to make it possible for more efficient uh, transports uh, and I can mention that there is a new invention also from Sweden uh, with um, remote controlled uh, towers for for aviation uh, which can also be extremely important to to remote control uh, aviation from one place to another place a lot, a lot far from there. Uh, and uh, there are a lot of different kinds of innovations that are already here, but also that are not yet invented, where we need to really uh, make sure that the the best solutions can reach the market and not be put away because there is no no money for for development. So that is our responsibility as well, I think. And they also put a hundred euro big fat tax on every ton of avoided CO2. 
and they seem to be doing very well. Thank you very much. So, you know, <laughs> it's possible. Thank you very much for that additional uh, uh, contribution. Let me now, just uh, to close this panel, ask you, Deputy G Director General Yi, to perhaps briefly pick up on the issue of ICT and talk just a bit about what you think its potential is uh, for dealing with some of the challenges of integrating transport uh, uh, infrastructure and services for trade, uh, certainly also perhaps with regard to the point that uh, Pravin Krishna made, there are a lot of uh, low-hanging fruits to be realized behind the border, for example, also in customs uh, and so on. ICT applications there that could be promising? Well, uh, in WTO, we are very close to a uh, multilateral agreement on uh, so-called ITA2, it's, uh, it's, uh, uh, in, uh, it's a technology products agreement uh, uh, which will, of course, uh, reduce the cost and uh, uh, facilitate uh, trade uh, on those products. And uh, as for the regulations behind the border, I think uh, we do have uh, good news. I mean. First of all, uh, I just want to emphasize uh, one good news. Uh, I, we share the same concern with uh, Angel on low, in, uh, low growth rate uh, of trade. But meanwhile, we, we reached agreement uh, on trade facilitation. That agreement, uh, once fully implemented, it will generate uh, more than one trillion dollars trade every year. So that will represent a very uh, huge uh, uh, business opportunities for tr uh, transport uh, industry. And meanwhile, we are, we are also working on other issues uh, uh, related to uh, regulations on services and on non-tariff barriers. I mean, once we get uh, the full support for, uh, from our members, then I think we can uh, hugely re reduce the trade cost and uh, facilitate uh, uh, transport. Thank you very, very much to all of you for these very thought-provoking and insightful contributions to our discussion on transport for tourism and trade. We'll be taking them with us into our second panel in this session. So I'll say thank you very much to all of you. Can we give them a very warm round of applause? Thank you. And Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister Truss. Thank you very much. And we will now move straight away into part two, as I say, taking some of those themes with us into our further discussion. And it is my great pleasure now to introduce our second very eminent panel and ask our panelists to please join me once again up here on the stage. Uh, we're just replacing, replacing the name tags uh, as I do introduce you. And I begin with Maxim Sokolov. He is Russia's Minister of Transport. His very extensive experience with trade and tourism issues also derives from previous service as director of the Government Department of Industry and Infrastructure and as chairman of the City of St. Petersburg's, Petersburg's Committee for Economic Development, Industrial Policy and Trade. Great that we can have you with us, Minister Sokolov. And here is your seat right here. Welcome. And it's a very great pleasure to welcome to this panel Dai Dong Chang. He is responsible for transport planning at the Chinese Ministry of Transport as a Communist Party of China leadership member. Between 2009 and 2014, he served as the ministry's chief planner, and prior to that, he headed the ministry's Department of Highways. Are you with us in the room, Dai Dong Chang? Yes, <laughs> please join me. Thank you so much. <laughs> it's your place. And a pleasure to welcome Yuriria Mascot Perez. She is Mexico's Under Secretary of Transportation. She previously served as General Director of the Mexican Postal Service, CEPOMEX, and she also has very extensive experience in the area of communications. A warm welcome to you.
And if I may ask Pravin Krishna to please return to our panel for the big picture view. So, very glad to have all of you with us. I need to get my translation set ready. Um, I would advise everyone else to do the same as well. We will now have some inputs in uh, other languages. I'll start out uh, with a question to you, Minister Sokolov. We spoke in the last panel about trade liberalization's implications for transport and vice versa. The Eurasia Economic Union came into effect last January, uh, and you have plans to coordinate with China as well on its Silk Road project. So obviously very big plans in terms of boosting trade, in terms of liberalization in your region. How do you plan to develop transport infrastructure and services to support these very, very ambitious trade goals that you have? Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues. Uh, let, me, let, me, um, let me greet you on behalf of the Ministry of Transport of the Russian Federation. Uh, I plan to speak in Russian because Russian is official language, one of the official languages of uh, our International Transport Forum, so please use your handphone. Уверен, что э I am sure that you are all convinced that in the present economic situation transport is key, transport is a priority and is very important for the development of our economies and is also very important for mobility of passengers and freight. The industry of global tourism over the last couple of years has created a very stable link with the transport sector. Recently there was a crisis. However, experts say that uh, last year already one billion people have moved around as tourists and uh, quite soon that will go up uh, to 2.5 billion. So there is a big growth in tourism, in tourism flows. So hence a lot of measures have to be taken nationally and internationally to safeguard that and to secure that. Uh, given Russia's geographical position and its size, we've got the longest roads and rail links in Russia worldwide so the longest worldwide also waterways almost a hundred thousand kilometers of waterways and uh, every day we move 50 million people daily mind any kind of system any means of transport has to be developed and uh, during the last decade 2.5 times more was invested in transport compared to the previous 10 years. And uh, we have had a threefold growth. The most dynamic areas are the following. Also, given the size of our country, the most dynamic area is, of course, air traffic. I can give you the following figures. 2014. 93 million passengers were moved and not just in the air but also on land we have created very good opportunities for travel and transport this year seven new and modern airports have been opened and more are in the pipeline and that is across our whole country, from our eastern to our western borders. And that is not just true for air traffic. We seriously look into a high-speed rail links. The efficiency is proven in Europe, also in the Pacific region. 
and now it's up to us. We want to create a bridge on the Eurasian continent. You may have heard that this, year, this month in Moscow an agreement was signed. Vladimir uh, Putin uh, took part and Xi Jinping from China. And this is about a high-speed rail link, a new Eurasian corridor between Moscow and Beijing. The first stage is 800 kilometers of a rail link between Moscow and Kazan. Kazan, next to the river Mo uh, Volga. Uh, last year there was the uh, Universiad. So the first uh, part will be 800 kilometers long. By the end of this year, another high-speed rail link will be finished, and I hope it will be inaugurated in 2016 together with my uh, German colleague, uh, Federal Minister Dobrindt, and that is the high-speed rail link between Moscow and Berlin. That will go through Warsaw and Minsk, the uh, Belarusian and Polish capitals. However, the most important event I would like to talk about is the Olympic Games last year, which is an important example how transport can revivify a whole region. In all areas of uh, transport, there have been de developments. New airports were built, intermodal connections were created, and uh, a large network of hotels has been created around those tra tra transport hubs. And not just a traffic and transport infrastructure is a good heritage. We are speaking about tourism as well. And for us, tourism has become a very important driver for further development, to develop Sochi further as a center of tourism. We are now thinking about applying for the football world championship. And uh, in uh, quite a number of uh, cities, the infrastructure is already being developed, especially uh, the towns which are actively involved in the Football World Championship 2018. And uh, those are great initiatives and drivers. When we talk about everyday problems, I would like to confirm our initiative, uh, which is about the uh, convention with the aim of simplifying rail traffic for passengers and freight. And we do the same for Eurasia. And we offer to discuss this topic today as well. Concluding, I would like to say that transport policies in Russia have always been part and parcel of government policies. We always have made sure that there should be sustainable development, and we see transport as an important element for the economic development of Russia. We would like to thank the summit, and we are well prepared to work constructively with you. And talk a bit about China's Silk Road uh, project, which was uh, the uh, subject of that agreement that was just signed uh, between your two governments. The Silk Road economic belt, uh, as envisaged by China, includes nearly four and a half billion people with a collective GDP amounting to nearly a third of the world's wealth, according to uh, Chinese assessments. So it's a very breathtaking vision, clearly. The region will to need enormous improvements in infrastructure to realize that vision. What are your plans uh, in terms of investments for infrastructure to achieve this, this truly breathtaking goal, Mr. Dai? Thank you. Well, I, first of all, I would like to say that the, uh, the initiative is uh, raised up and the background of the economic the, uh, development of the world. At all, you know, with the intensification of economic globalization, advance in the digital information technology, and the uh, dynamic, uh, dynamics of the internet-based uh, internet economy, the transport landscape, uh, especially the uh, Asia, 
Europe transport has taken on some new shape or new landscape, I would say. I, I see mainly three new features. Um, first is the land transport is on the rise. A, for example, in recent years, container tra train, tra uh, train transport, the train services is on the back of existing Eurasia railway facilities have been put into operation, uh, just as we mentioned, on the back of existing Eurasian railway facilities. And uh, it has been put into operation on a large scale, connecting Asia and Europe. And uh, through the year's efforts, it has achieved a great, we, we can see the great potential and already a very dynamic, uh, very uh, viable uh, uh, efficiency of it. And uh, second, I think the, the second feature is the sea land combined transport. There has emerged a trend for the countries in Northeast Asia, Southeast Asia, and Central and East Europe in exploring the possibility of sea land combined transport. And this is another feature. So the one is the air transport is reposed for high and a consumer goods between Asia and Europe, Europe uh, the, particularly in the Asia market. So the rising demand and, uh, and its new features in transport has also brought uh, towards the challenges and uh, problems, and uh, such as the lack of transport infrastructure, the harmonized uh, standards for infrastructure construction, and also transport equipment and also failure in the implementation of transport agreements and inconsistency regarding the legal and management practice uh, in the region. So these, those are the challenges and problems we have to tackle with. Based on this, I think the, the initiative of the road, uh, the Barrett and Road uh, is, uh, is one of the solution uh, to tackle uh, those, uh, the problems and take the challenges. Um, as you know, the road and uh, the belt and the road, namely the Silk Road Economic Belt and the 21st Century Marine Time Silk Road, so that means two, two aspects. The, uh, it runs through the continents of Asia, Europe, and Africa, connecting the vibrant East Asia at one end and the development, developed European economic circle at the other. Uh, this region with huge potential for economic development. On land, the initiative will focus on jointly building a new Eurasian land bridge and developing China, Mongolia, Russia, China, Central Asia, West Asia, and the China, Indo China Peninsula Economic Corridors. Your microphone. Okay. No, no you can just take your microphone oh, closer, okay. please. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry. Uh, by taking advantage of international transport routes, at sea, the in initiative will focus on jointly building smooth, secure, and efficient transport routes connecting major seaports along the belt and the road. And at what you can see that the initiative is open for cooperation, actually it needs joint efforts, and it follows market operation. Uh, we have to follow a, a market operation and seeks the mutual benefits. As, uh, as a start, I will have a brief introduction of this. Thank you. Thank you very, very much uh, for your, uh, your uh, remarks, and particularly for that look at your um, big plans uh, to develop infrastructure in uh, Eurasia. Now, I'm very mindful of the remarks that we heard from Professor Krishna in his keynote, uh, saying that infrastructure investment can bring enormous economic productivity gains, but that in order to do so, it needs a very strong institutional framework to ensure transparency, accountability, and efficiency uh, in, uh, in procurement, in tenders. Now, I know that Mexico has been doing a lot of work in that area, particularly in regard to infrastructure uh, 
planning and spending for the new airport. And I wonder if you, uh, Ms. Mascot, could, could tell us a bit about how Mexico has been trying to ensure that those very big public capital expenditures are in fact going to the most productive end possible. Muchas gracias. Antes que nada. Thank you very much. First of all, I would like to mention that together with uh, Russia and China, I regard transport as essential for trade and tourism. In Mexico, the federal government, I would just like to mention this at the beginning of my statement, uh, in Mexico, the federal government uh, was in charge of the tender of the new airport, and I would like to talk about how we concluded contracts and agreements with OECD so as to put the project to tender, because it has been the most important project for Mexico ever, this airport. The Mexican government proposed to uh, turn Mexico into a large global logistics center that comes with an added value. This is due to the privileged location of Mexico in geographical terms, close to the United States between North and South America, but also with access to Europe and Asia. This is what we want to expand on, and this is why we created some projects that focused on enhancing transport infrastructure. In the course of this project, we took care of keeping the costs low, while enhancing the quality of life of all of our citizens. We started railroad projects as well as cargo projects. Our projects uh, also dealt with trains, passenger trains. We are currently building new highways and 3,000 kilometers of routes and we will also construct 90 new roads. As for the airport, which is a specific question directed at the need for investment, 20% of our infrastructure was spent on important airports, Cancun, Los Tacos, Tijuana, Pelajara, Monterrey. This is where we in invested. And the most important project of the government was the new airport, the International Airport of Mexico City. It's an airport that uh, we spent $13 billion US op dollars on, and now the last terminal has entered its phase of development. With it, it will become one of the largest airports of the world and will be equipped with most modern technologies. We will enter the construction stage, and in this hot stage of construction, uh, of operation, we will have 120 million um, passengers per day. This will put an end to the strain we put on the existing airports, and we will give an answer to precisely the challenges that uh, have prohibited our country from becoming a hub between North and South America so far. In order to do so, we have uh, uh, published a tender, and this year we concluded a contract with the OECD regarding the public tender of the airport. This contract that we concluded with the OECD especially considers the following points. On the one hand, during the entire tender process, the international organization OECD will accompany us and advise us and train all those in charge of the tender. Without a doubt, the advice given by OECD and the International Transport Organization is an important contribution to eliminate the notion that public funds being spent on the project are spent inefficiently. Within the context of other projects, we have to say that it is important that the trust in the government is backed up. 
because on the one hand the government wants to protect consumer interests but on the other of course we want to eliminate the worries of all those investing in the projects the government's actions are based on four principles we want to have full transparency we want to listen to all parties involved and we want to have a balance between the technological side and construction restrictions and we want to focus on the result in mexico we're convinced that transport is the very basis of development and the competitiveness of a country and this is why we regard this international forum that we attend to as a very important platform thank you of how important trust is in the context of major infrastructure investments. As a resident of the city of Berlin, I am particularly interested uh, in hearing your remarks about trust uh, in the context of new airport construction. And uh, <laughs> in addition, thanks very much for your explication of what the OECD and the ITF can do to help reinforce capacity in that area, uh, a very uh, important contribution indeed. So many thanks for that. Pravin Krishna, um, you actually mentioned uh, trust and public confidence uh, in connection with uh, Prime Minister Modi's plans in India to try to um, promote uh, manufacturing, investment, trade, and so on. I wonder if you could just give us a bit of uh, background, given the work that you have done on and with India, in regard to Minister Modi's plans to upgrade infrastructure. He has big aims in that area. Um, what kind of barriers and trade-offs is the government facing when it comes to implementation? Uh, thank you. So let me, just in terms of background first, uh, describe a bit what the state of infrastructure is and where the Prime Minister would like to see it go. So my understanding is that India has sort of quantitatively, uh, let's say, the second largest uh, road network uh, in the world. Uh, but from a qualitative standpoint, it's rather weak. If you look at high quality roads, highways, four lane highways and so forth, uh, what it has is about per person, what it has is about one tenth or one fifteenth that of your comparable uh, OECD average, let's say, uh, country. Uh, surface freight takes twice as long as it does in China, three times as long as it does in, in Europe. Uh, and at the same time, 65% of Indian freight is by road. So it's actually very heavily reliant on, on roads. 85% of uh, passengers' uh, transportation is by road. So it's very heavily reliant on this. Now, the Prime Minister uh, has announced, the government has announced, uh, very ambitious plans to scale up. Uh, they would like to proceed in terms of highway building this year. I gather uh, the target that they've set is 30 kilometers per day uh, of road building, and this is against in a context in which what was actually achieved in the past, in the last 10 years or so, is something closer to three kilometers of building per day. So it's about 10 times uh, higher is the scale that they want to, they want to achieve, uh, which, is, which is very ambitious. What are the challenges that they face? Uh, it's a very complicated set of issues, a very complicated political economy. Um, to begin with, there are numerous uh, turf battles between the highways ministry, the railways ministry, the environmental ministry, and so on and so forth, uh, that make it difficult to simply get projects uh, off the ground, things that are otherwise seem sensible, uh, that are reasonable, that are necessary, uh, are difficult to sort of pull off. The land that is necessary to be acquired in order for a road to be built uh, is already very, it's, it's very difficult to do that. It's very challenging to acquire the land. Uh, one of the major political battles ongoing in India right now is about legislation having to do with land acquisition. Uh, and so how do you, uh, you know, how does the government exercise eminent domain? How do they acquire land for this purpose? Uh, there, is not, there does not seem to be broad agreement on how one proceeds, how do you compensate people whose land is being taken. Uh, and so just this first step of kind of in, in the development already is a very po politically contentious uh, issue. Uh, it is expected that the government will win this battle and, some, and maybe some diluted version of the legislation they've already introduced is going to go through, but, it, but it's been a bruising battle uh, for them already. Uh, there are related issues about displacement of peoples, their compensation, uh, especially when one thinks about 
um, sort of extending the road networks into remote areas where you have sort of tribals uh, who've been living there for hundreds of years. How do you uh, displace them? What's the mechanism? Uh, are they interested in moving? What if they're not? Uh, how do you manage that? These are, these are interesting, difficult challenges. India also has other complicated issues. For example, uh, road construction. If you say, uh, you know, so we just, we have the financing, let's start building the road. Uh, it's not clear how you actually do that. Uh, there's various areas, principalities, local areas where uh, using machinery to build roads is actually forbidden. So it's not agreed to. And so you need to use, because there's lots of available labor, you need to use individual labor, individuals with shovels actually building roads uh, rather than machines. And that's, that's, that's what you just have to deal with. These are, of course, low quality roads. Uh, they need severe maintenance once they're built. And so that, that's yet another challenge. How do you actually uh, break, break through that? Uh, financing is, is yet another question. Um, pockets are, are not very deep. This is not at the moment seen as the most crucial issue, but it is an important one. Uh, private participation in terms of road building, I, I understand, has is, is not been as, uh, as intense or the private sector has not been as interested recently in participating as one might have hoped. And so the government is playing with alternative models of hybrid financing with some participation by the government, some by the private sector, and so forth, to try and see if they can get this, uh, get this off the ground. There's kind of an old joke in India that, um, an old joke in India that uh, India grows at night uh, because that's when the politicians are asleep. Uh, and, and so, um, nevertheless, the energy that this government has shown in sort of advancing the infrastructure agenda, I'm, I'm more optimistic than I've been in the past that the politicians might be awake and that India will still, will still grow in this instance. Thank you very much. Um, I'm a bit mindful of the time, so I'd like to ask for very, very brief answers on perhaps one final question, again, related to the balance between the economic goals, uh, the economic gains that can be realized by expanding investment for transport infrastructure to promote trade, to promote tourism. All of you have been very, very clear about the promise that you see out there. But the balance between those and, once again, environmental considerations, social inclusion considerations. Um, Minister Sokolov, when you're looking at these new investments, particularly for the Eurasian, uh, the expansion of infrastructure in Eurasia, what role do environmental considerations play? Do you say to yourself, okay, also important, but secondary to growth? Uh no, I wouldn't say so, not at all. There is a balance that we try to comply with, especially in the transport sector, regarding the environment and environment-friendly transport modes. This is one of the six targets in our strategy on the development of the transport infrastructure targeted at 2030. This is a strategy that the Russian government has already kicked off. And we can say in our full right that we do consider environmental aspects. Uh, right on uh, to you, Mr. Dai. Um, I know that at least some of the $3 billion that you plan to spend for the Silk Road infrastructure, at least that's one estimate that I saw, will be funded by the new Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. I assume you can't say too much about its environmental and social standards, but perhaps a word on that and a word about how your own ministry approaches this, uh, this very sensitive balance between the economic goals on the one side and environmental goals on the other? Well, yes, the uh, environmental issue is always a major concern for any major investment program, uh, particularly in the transport uh, construction program. Uh, back in China, the, uh, the transport the sector is one of the uh, major uh, focus uh, point of the environmental issues um, as our strategy and uh, target we also make the uh, green transport as one of the false targets 
or the fourth strategy, uh, including the um, integrated, safe, green, and intelligent. So like the uh, Russia, you have six strategies, and we have four, aimed for the four strategies. So you can see the green transport is one of the strategy. And we tackle the environmental issue at different levels. First of all, is at the um, planning level. Uh, for any major plan, the, uh, we have the evaluation, the environmental ev evaluation, and, uh, and then at project level, uh, regarding its design is the, uh, and also the construction uh, construction plan. And then the at operation and the maintenance level, uh, that's regarding the infrastructure side. And also regarding the, uh, the uh, transport service, uh, we have the, uh, also disciplines for the uh, clean energy, the and, uh, uh, clean fuel and clean energy, the new um, such as the electricity cars, electricity bicycles, and um, to improve the environment, uh, the situation, reduce the, uh, the emission. Uh, regarding the uh, Asia Invest, uh, Infrastructure Development Bank, uh, because it's still in the initial um, stage of its establishment, and uh, as I know, the, uh, the institution is, and uh, underlying is drafting all the documents and uh, the environment side, the environment concerns one of it, the major concern of it, and uh, during the process we'll have the con full consultation with all the parties concerned and also, and also I believe that with the, exp with the foundation of the experience in China and also the experience in other parts of the world, particularly the international institutions, such as the World Bank, the Asia Development Bank, and other international investment uh, organizations. The, I believe the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank will have a better foundation and will, have a, will, have make, uh, will make a better documentation on the environmental issues. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, perhaps also a question in the same uh, regard uh, to you, Under Secretary Mascot, but broadening it out a bit, because I know that the Mexican government has placed a lot of emphasis uh, recently on trying to put into place institutional structures that will promote greater policy integration, greater policy coherence. Uh, clearly very, very important in this area where there are so many cross-cutting issues, trade and tourism, of course, uh, uh, sharing many, many issues that require an institutional and holistic uh, approach. What is Mexico doing in that area uh, to promote that kind of out of the silos thinking also when it comes to the environment? Uh, thank you very much for this uh, question. We think uh, that in uh, Mexico, efficiently getting people from A to B, and uh, the same for tourists, that that may become a vicious circle. On the one hand, that leads to higher productivity, to a higher standard of living, and to a higher competitiveness. Uh, the uh, means of transport in uh, uh, cities are uh, to do with economies of scale, hence higher fuel consumption. We have to optimize the uh, demand for space as well, and we have to channel transport. That is then implemented in a better quality of life uh, for our citizens, a shorter traveling times, better environment, and uh, better links for the corporate world. Mexico is undergoing a process of change, lots of structural reform, uh, the uh, government led by Enrique Peña Nieto has decided to turn Mexico into a big hub in America.
and for that transport is crucial in order to enhance competitiveness but also to foster tourism. As uh, our moderator, as Melinda has already uh, said it, in Mexico there is a cabinet where all the ministries are represented and where they all work together. Uh, for instance, uh, to take the example of the new, new airport, there is a Minister of Communication and Transport being in charge of that project, but the other ministries are represented as well, starting with the uh, Tourism Ministry, Economics Ministry, Urban Development, also representatives from uh, finance institutions. And this combination of uh, all areas and all institutions leads to a good analysis and to a deep analysis what the next steps could be. And, um, and uh, that works very well. Of course, the Mexican government has uh, the uh, responsibility to make uh, transport links as efficient as possible. It is also about a better quality of life, and for that we have to tap all the opportunities, and that will have a positive impact on productivity and competitiveness of our national economy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. One last word from you, perhaps, Pravin Krishna, before we close our panel and our session, and it also relates to this idea that in order to meet these three very different and sometimes potentially conflicting aspects of sustainability, and or in order to set policy, whether it's in the trade and tourism area or in other areas of human endeavor, we have to begin to get more holistic approaches, more integrated integrated approaches. How do we get there? What, what are the steps that really can foster that kind of change? Well, it's a, it's a complicated question. I'm sure it's some combination of technology, technological development, science, politics. Um, I, could, I could look into the Indian context now just to see you know, where, because this has been a kind of a long-standing discussion in India as well, how as a country that's not as wealthy, doesn't perhaps have the most uh, advanced technologies um, to kind of com combat these issues. How, how, do we, how do we nevertheless make progress? Uh, and my understanding now is that, as far as the Indian government is concerned, one, they've taken the position uh, that they do want to take a lead in sort of these climate change discussions, discussions that are coming up uh, in December in Paris. Uh, and, and within that, the priorities that they've set for themselves are in kind of renewable energies that they want to kind of launch major thrusts in solar and wind, for example, uh, but don't necessarily see at the same time uh, CO2 emissions and caps on that as being a reasonable uh, strategy for themselves. Now, whether that's the right thing to do, whether that's optimal is unclear. As far as more holistic approaches uh, to your question, uh, among the other things that the government has announced is that they want uh, you know, to introduce sort of better opportunities for, you know, bicycling, for example. Um, the Prime Minister has even said something about uh, the introduction of yoga. I'm not quite sure what that means. I'm interested in understanding a <laughs> well, little bit holistic. better. That would be truly <laughs> holistic, uh, just to see what that means and how that, how, how that could possibly help. Uh, but, but I suppose there's a range of things and, and no one answer really that's going to work for uh, all the countries at once. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to all of our panelists for being with us also for this uh, discussion on trade, tourism, and transport to support both um, many insights that we will carry forward in further discussions throughout the summit. So I'm very grateful to all four of you for being with us today. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, yes, I'll just let you return to your seats before I attempt the very briefest of wrap-ups. Certainly we did hear many, many assertions today of the importance of trying to boost trade because of the immense gains that it can bring, both economic gains, social inclusion gains, 
but again, with an awareness of some of the institutional frameworks that need to be in place to ensure that those gains can be realized, both in the sense of the kind of um, accountability and transparency frameworks that we just heard discussed, uh, and for that also the great importance of opportunities to share best practices, to share institutional capacity support, such as the ITF and the OECD have been offering uh, to Mexico in that respect. Also, the need for trade liberalization to realize those gains, and at the same time, the fact that countries nonetheless cannot abdicate their responsibility for setting regulatory frameworks, for setting legislative frameworks that ensure, for example, uh, that social inclusion and environmental targets can be reached while attempting at the same time to promote uh, economic productivity. In future panels, we're going to be picking up on all all of those subjects, as we do, continue to discuss transport for trade and tourism. So many, many thanks to all of our speakers for getting us off to this very, very constructive beginning. And we will now continue trading in ideas, as uh, Secretary General Viegas urged us to do, uh, throughout the rest of the summit. So I wish all of you very productive sessions, and I thank to all of you in the audience for your attention during this opening plenary. You now have an opportunity to refresh yourself at a coffee break, and after that, we do have two panels on trade patterns and maritime transport on the one hand, and improving the user's experience on transport for tourists on the other. So I wish everyone a very enjoyable afternoon and look forward to seeing you at the latest back here tomorrow. Goodbye. Thanks again.